Good afternoon. Thank you for, for being here with us for this uh, oral session about um, from topic 1.4 about the multidisciplinary studies of the Earth subsystems. So we, we had a very interesting poster session yesterday, and now we'll have a, a few talks. Uh, we were supposed to have five talks, but we, we finally have, uh, have four. And sadly, we will have two uh, talks that were video recordings because two of the speakers could not travel to Vienna uh, in the end. So we will have uh, two video recordings, so no, no question uh, du du during the session, but we can post your question online or you can post your question on the, uh, on the contribution of the speakers. They, they, will, uh, they will answer if you have any. And we have two of the speakers that are here with us this afternoon uh, that, we will, uh, that we will introduce uh, later. So just to let you know what, how we will try to, to do this, how we will do it, is that we will, uh, um, as usual, have the speaker in, in, to, doing the talks, and at the end, we'll take a few questions from the audience, if there's any, or take a couple of questions from the uh, online uh, um, platform, if, uh, if there is any. And uh, we will be mindful of the time. Should you introduce yourself? Okay. So in case you don't know me and you have not heard of, of me enough already from the last couple of days, I, I am Pierrick. Uh, I work at the uh, International Data Center. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here and I'm very happy to be co-hosting, uh, to co-convening this with uh, my co-convener. So uh, Dmitry Stolchak from the International Seismological Center, ISC in the UK. And happy to share it with Pierrick. So, the first uh, talk will be given on the screen, as you heard. It's Elizabeth Silber from Sandia National Labs. Thank you all for attending my talk. Here I will present infrasound observations of the earth grazing fireball that occurred on September 22nd. 2020. Our planet is continuously bombarded by extraterrestrial particles or meteoroids, which upon entering the upper atmosphere produce a visual phenomenon known as a meteor. This happens when uh, meteoroids reach denser regions of the atmosphere. Very bright meteors or fireballs are generally produced by objects greater than about 10 centimeters in diameter. The average entry angle of a meteoroid is 45 degrees on our planet and other planetary bodies as well. However, when it comes to extreme entry angles, either very shallow or very steep relative to the horizon, these are very rare. Meteoroids entering the atmosphere at such shallow angle that they graze the upper region of the atmosphere are known as earth grazers. There are very few well-documented observations of earth grazers recorded in literature over the past 50 years. Some uh, actually date back to uh, many, many years ago. Here's, for example, a painting of a meteor of 1860. This was an earth grazer. There was another one in 1972 uh, called uh, Gray Daylight Fireball that graze the sky over the US and uh, Canada as well. While some Earth grazers completely ablate, some survive their passage through the atmosphere and return to space. In the latter scenario, meteoroids must have sufficiently large mass and velocity and are typically called fireballs. Fireballs are basically very bright uh, meteors. Earth grazers do not readily penetrate very deep into the atmosphere, which is relevant to infrasound detections of such events. In addition to producing a visual phenomenon, fireballs are capable of generating shock waves that can decay to very low frequency acoustic waves, also known as infrasound. Infrasound being very low frequency suffers from little attenuation as well and can propagate over very long distances hundreds of or even thousands of kilometers away. Therefore, bolides being explosive sources in the atmosphere can be detected by sensitive uh, ground-based microphones. However, when it comes to high altitude events, very, very high altitude, we're talking about 100 kilometers or higher, uh, such events are extremely uh, rare uh, when it comes to producing infrasound 
and only a handful of such events have been documented in literature. Uh, moreover, when it comes to earth quasars in particular, they're especially rare. Uh, for example, uh, this is because of three main reasons. Earth quasars are rare, they don't penetrate deep into the atmosphere, and their geometry makes them uh, challenging when it comes to detection via infrasound. In fact, only one earth grazer before this one was detected by infrasound, and that was 1972 uh, gray daylight fireball. However, at the time, infrasound records were classified, and uh, even though the analysis was done, nothing was released uh, into public domain, uh, not in including uh, waveform and uh, particulars about the signal. So this particular event is the first infrasound recording of an earth grazer uh, in, in recent times. A rare horizon to horizon earth grazer event occurred over Northern Europe on September 22nd, 2020 at about 4 UTC. It captured the attention of many eyewitnesses and numerous ground-based cameras aimed at the skies. As per the analysis released by the Global Meteor Network, the luminous path of the Earth grazing fireball started over Germany and ended over the UK at the altitude of 101 kilometers, that was the entry, and 107 kilometers, that was the exit altitude. The point of closest approach was 90 kilometers, so this was a very high altitude event. The object's velocity upon the entry was fairly uh, high, 34 kilometers per second, and only slightly less, uh, 30 kilometers per second when it exited. That means it lost very little energy as it uh, grazed the upper regions of the atmosphere. Here's the video recording uh, frame by frame showing the Earth grazer. It pretty much covered uh, the entire sky, horizon to horizon. It was a very beautiful event. Uh, no flares, no fragmentation, and it has lost a fairly small amount of energy before it exited back into space. Here is the ground track of the trajectory. The hypersonic flight of the Earth grazer was northeast to southwest. Uh, the map also shows the relative locations of the three arrays of the KNMI network that detected the meteor, and this is something I will discuss on the next slide. Despite its high altitude and apparently silent, at least to humans, passage through the atmosphere, the Earth grazer was detected by infrasound sensors of the Royal Netherlands Meteorological Institute, or KNMI, several minutes after it had entered the atmosphere. Three infrasound arrays of the KNMI network detected the signals. These were EXL, DBN, and CIA. The signal was first detected by EXL array at 03.58.44 UTC, only a few minutes after the onset of the luminous path. EXL was in fact located closest uh, to the trajectory and also was nearly beneath the trajectory. The infrasonic signatures at all three arrays exhibited an N-wave appearance, diagnostic of a ballistic shock. The frequency content was below 5 Hz, and we will see spectrogram uh, very shortly. Uh, the signal trace velocity at all stations was high, which is also indicative of a direct arrival from a high-altitude shock produced by the cylindrical line source. Here is the figure showing signal characteristics at EXL. EXL was in the close proximity to the Earth grazer, and actually uh, it was be right below uh, the trajectory. The apparent signal arrival was nearly vertical, which is uh, consistent with our conclusion that the signal was ballistically generated. Further to this, as seen in panel A, uh, the signal had an N-wave signature, which is also consistent with a ballistic shock. The upper right, or panel B, shows the APSTAT, while the two lower panels, C and D, show back azimuth 
and trace velocity on the right. What's actually interesting to note, the trace velocity is very high. We rarely see this from uh, meteoroids, but we had absolutely perfect geometry here where a meteoroid pretty much sweeped uh, just above the array, which is quite, uh, quite rare. So we have a very rare fireball, but also we have uh, rare geometry of the detection. Uh, so this is uh, great uh, in a scientific sense. The figure shows spectrogram at the Excel. Uh, the frequency content was fairly low, uh, below 5 hertz, which is expected considering the high altitude of the event. And also, uh, it doesn't seem to be overly energetic. Uh, also confirmed with our analysis, uh, which I will discuss momentarily. Uh, the time axis uh, shows time in hours after uh, 3 UTC. We hypothesized that the signal detected at TXL came from a different part of the trail compared to that detected at two other arrays, DBN and CIA. Uh, right now, some additional work is underway to confirm that hypothesis. Uh, so we will be providing updates uh, soon in a publication. Uh, we also calculated the average dominant signal period across the three stations. This was approximately one and a half seconds. Uh, the dominant signal period can be leveraged towards calculating uh, yield of an event. So using the aptac energy relations adapted to bolides, we have obtained the energy estimate at about 18 plus or minus 8 tons of TNT equivalent across the three stations. I should mention that these uh, aptac energy relations, they utilize signal period. They were originally developed uh, towards uh, calculating yield for nuclear explosions and uh, were later modified uh, specifically in 1990s by Doug Ravel to, uh, towards uh, estimating energy uh, by bolides. Uh, basically, these relations are modified so they don't include the energy. Uh, there is no radiation component uh, associated with them. Uh, nuclear explosions have radi radiation component, but bolides don't. Uh, our preliminary estimate places the meteoroid diameter at about one meter. Assuming the chondritic composition, the mass estimate is about one and a half metric tons. In conclusion, this was a very rare event. Uh, we had a fantastic opportunity that it had uh, entered over a region that was uh, uh, bridge with infrasound arrays and had just right geometry and orientation. Uh, the extremely shallow entry angle of the fireball enabled the infrasound wave to readily propagate downward, thus assuming a direct path to the receiver. Uh, this is a very unique event and it certainly provides valuable constraints for infrasound detection and characterization of high altitude meteor events. I should also add that uh, very high altitude infrasound events are extremely rare. And especially when it comes to meteoroids, um, we only have a very, very small number documented in literature. And uh, I thank you all for attention. If you are interested in references associated with this presentation, they're on the next slide. And also, if you are interested uh, to reach out to me with any more questions, feel free to do so. Thank you again. So the next talk is given by Julian Vergoz from CEA in France. Thank you very much. So indeed, I'm uh, Julien Vergoz. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm from uh, French NDC. And in uh, that presentation, I'm going to talk about the uh, actually uh, multi-technology IMS observations of uh, the different waves, which were produced by the January 2022 uh, eruption of Hunga Tunga uh, volca volcano at a global scale, with a special focus on uh, infrasound and uh, acoustic gravity waves. 
and I'm very honored to present uh, that uh, study, which was led by CA and BGR, uh, the German uh, NDC, and 15 co-authors from nine different institutes. Uh, as all of you already know, I guess, uh, this eruption broke a number of records uh, in many areas. Uh, the number of uh, observations of different technologies is really unprecedented. For example, the plume height uh, reached the stratopause at uh, more than uh, 57 kilometers. Uh, the horizontal extension of the umbrella reached 500 kilometers. Um, almost 400,000 lightnings were detected in six hours. The eruption was heard even in Alaska uh, in more than 9,000 kilometers. And for the first time, the full infrasound component of the EMS network which consisted of uh, 53 stations was detected. Uh, the, so, sorry, the station detected the, the event. Uh, the UNGA discharge 7 to 9.5, so still under discussion, but of discharge this quantity of material in the atmosphere. And from this uh, bathymetric campaign, you can see that you have a major uh, caldera forming events uh, with the previous caldera, uh, which uh, collapsed of more than 700 meters. Uh, since the, so in the recent past and since the first IMS stations, uh, actually there were already several eruptions which were captured by the, by the IMS network. Uh, during the 2009 eruption, the volcanic uh, activity was underwater. It was very well captured on hydroacoustic stations in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, during the 2014-2015 eruption, the volcano raised uh, the sea, uh, so raised above the sea level, so a new island was created. It just connected the Unga Hapai uh, Island and the Unga Tunga uh, Islands. And uh, the uh, volcanic activity transitioned from underwater to atmospheric, which are also very well captured on the hydroacoustic and infrasound stations of the EMS network. And uh, the last eruptions uh, in December uh, 2021 began the 19th of December and during that eruption the volcano uh, continued to grow and after a short silence uh, it violently erupted during a climactic phase uh, and finally the volcano collapsed and this time uh, the volcanic activity transitioned from infrasonic to hydroacoustic signals. So now let's focus on this last sequence, the 2021-2022 relative sequence. Here's a two-month view of the uh, infrasound activity uh, recorded at the closest IMS station in New Caledonia, IS-22, which record a very nice uh, signal of infrasound under favorable uh, propagation conditions. You have also REB events, and you have hydroacoustic activity at Juan Fernandez hydrophone station in Chile, uh, for Chile, at 10,000 kilometers. So the sequence began by continuous and moderate infrasound. It's lasted two weeks, and during that time, almost no seismic and hydroacoustic activity. After a silence of 10, uh, 10 days, uh, the volcano woke up again, and stronger, much stronger infrasound were recorded, 10 times bigger. It lasted 28 hours, and after, and after the silence again, no seismic, no hydroacoustic acti activity, and 10 hours later, you have this climatic phase. Okay, you have huge, massive infrasound, other atmospheric waves, and moderate uh, seismic and uh, hydroacoustic activity. And after a last uh, explosion four hours later, you have no infrasound at all. The atmospheric activity is completely finished. A few points here which are actually microbiomes. It's not associated to volcanic activity. And you have, this time, uh, a strong or uh, intense activity in terms of number uh, of hydroacoustic and seismic. Uh, signals, and that we interpret this as a post-caldera forming event after shock sequence. To try to understand the hydroacoustic signals, we plot here the signals from the four hydroacoustic stations in the Pacific Ocean, so in Wake Island and in Juan Fernandez Island, so four triplets, here's uh, signals in black. Uh, in blue, uh, at the bottom, you have the seismic signals at a regional uh, station, okay, which is dominated by uh, uh, seismic surface waves. And at the top, you have teleseismic P waves in Texas, so filter in the P wave band. And from the low frequency content of these hydroacoustic signals, and the really the resemblance between the, hydro the hydroacoustic signals and the seismic signals, we interpret these 
hydroacoustic signals as T waves, okay, which means that this, these are uh, seismic waves which are coupled in the ocean at the uh, ocean, uh, at the, sorry, uh, at the underground, uh, at the ground uh, ocean interface. And this direct path, all the direct paths to the stations are blocked and uh, we have identified the areas where the ground ocean coupling occurred, which are the colored rectangle on the, uh, on the map. And this means, for example, on Wake Island, 5,000 kilometers north of the station, you observe actually the seismic activity at the volcano through the new island, okay? The island is uh, inside the yellow uh, rectangle, okay? Which played the role as a repeater, okay? Where P uh, uh, go to, uh, to, to T waves. Okay, so now let's talk about atmospheric waves. So here you have a, uh, the dispersion curve of the atmospheric waves. So in the high frequency, you have acoustic waves. And in the low part of the acoustic waves, you have infrasound. And the IMS network has been dedicated, has been designed to detect these uh, this infrasound waves. These infrasound are very sensitive to the structure of the middle atmosphere and propagate in all the directions. In the low frequency, you have uh, you have the internal gravity waves, okay, that also propagate mostly uh, vertically and which are also sometimes recorded by the, by the MS network. And to bridge the gap between these two modes, you have this surface-guided long waves, okay, which propagate only along the Earth's surface with a horizontal uh, motion. And all of these modes were detected by the uh, IMS networks after the, uh, during the, the climatic phase. On the closer station, so in uh, New Caledonia, once again, you can see very clearly the long wave and the infrasound which arrive at the same time. And you can read different the spectrograms, so different signals. And you also uh, see the internal gravity waves, okay, which arrive to the horizontal line uh, four hours later. After 15,000 of kilometers, uh, you are here in Kenya, you see once again the long waves, the direct arrival, the antipodal arrivals, and the infrasound, okay, which propagate at uh, slow, so slower, so which arrive almost one hour later, one hour after the, the long waves, okay. And we observe some really unprecedented propagation feature on that station, which are these double uh, lines here, almost parallel, which are associated to the thermospheric and stratospheric uh, ducts. Uh, and this is a really uh, unprecedented uh, observation with thermospheric arrival, which arrived before stratospheric arrival. So, uh, to observe the full spectrum of the atmospheric wave, you need to deconvolve the BDF data, which is the uh, infrasound channels. And after this uh, infrasound uh, deconvolution, after the instrument uh, deconvolution, you can observe this, uh, this full spectrum. And I think it's worth men to mention that the deconvolution was successful for, 30, for 47 of the 53 uh, stations of the IMS network. And after deconvolution, the IMS infrasound stations, so only microbarometers, are capable to capture different, all different wave modes in very broad frequency bands, so five decades between 0.1 millihertz to 10 hertz. Uh, from one single instrument. And also, it provides the opportunity to do some array processing uh, on a very broad band, so including LAMB and infrasound. And you have he here the results. Uh, once again, on the Kenyan station, you have three days of data uh, with a single run of uh, DTK PMCC. And uh, we can observe, so on the, the, the first line, you have in the time frequency space the back ADMS and just below the, the, the trace velocity. And you clearly see the infrasound de detections associated to the infrasound and to the long waves, some strong ADMS deviations which are not fully understood uh, yet. And also, so this for the direct rays and for the antipodal waves at the end of the, of the signal. And also the interaction between this wave, especially the infrasound wave, with the turbulence, uh, the wind turbulence, which uh, which uh, spectral levels significantly impact infrasound above 2 millihertz. And so you can really interpret uh, what is uh, infrasound signal and what is noise in terms of wind noise. This is how to separate signal and wind. Okay, if we do this deconvolution and if we process so the uh, array processing on all the EMS stations, here is what you obtain. Okay, you have here the 53 
uh, IMS stations, so sorted by distance, as a function of time. So the duration is 5.5 days. So the black curves are the deconvolved uh, data. Okay, it is dominated by long waves. You see an almost perfect M shape, so non-dispersive waves which propagate almost at a constant uh, velocity, typical to, to long waves, at least in theory. And you have this almost perfect M shape. And these long waves were recorded up to four circumnavigations. The infrasounds are behind these colored rectangles. Okay, you cannot see they are, the, the signals are dominated by, uh, by long waves. And here are very unclear and unperfect M shape. Infrasounds are very sensitive to the middle atmospheric uh, dynamics. Okay, so you have travel times which really depend on the atmospheric dynamic, which, which is not the case for long waves. Okay? And they're also sensitive to this wind noise. Okay? So sometimes you detect, sometimes you don't detect. But for some paths, some very specific paths, we have detected uh, that infrasound were recorded 13 days after the event, okay? after eight circumnavigations. As you can see here at the bottom uh, plots, uh, and this was observed in the station in Ivory Coast, and also in the Guadeloupe, in the, in the Caribbean, IS-25. Yield estimate, delicate issue. Of course, this requires to know uh, the source process, to understand it, to model it, to have a precise yield estimate. Here, we've decided to use two methods. First is uh, Pierce and Posey, okay, which is a mathematical formula which was developed in 71 uh, to estimate uh, the explosive yield of nuclear explosions. Uh, and this from the period and the amplitude of the long waves. You can see here the, the, the decrease of the peak-to-peak -peak overpressure of the wave as a function of distance. You can see this uh, focusing effect, the estimation for different stations. And with that uh, method, we estimate the yield to be 100, uh, above 100, around 110 of megatons. With another, uh, another method, which is called the Sachs scaling relation, which is tailored for detonations. And for this, we used three barometers in what we call some sweet spots, uh, which are uh, between 700 and, H and uh, 900 kilometers from, uh, from, the, from the events. And from that low, we estimate to be around 200 megatons. So these methods are, of course, far to be perfect, but they are matching in the order of magnitude. And this estimates rank this explosion Okay, this eruption uh, to be comparable with Krakatoa uh, historical uh, eruption. So here, very fastly, just a comparison of uh, yield estimates that you can find in the, the literature from different technology for different methods. Okay, and here you can see that uh, the different uh, yield estimates range from tens to hundreds of megatons. Oh, so just uh, to say that a lot of work it is it's still required. To, uh, to refine this, uh, these values. Okay, to finish, the source terms. So here, we try to compare the source terms inferred from seismoacoustic uh, observations. So here at the bottom, you have the seismic source time function, which has been estimated from the uh, seismic surface waves. Uh, above, you have the pressure, so at, uh, absolute pressure, at the uh, Nuku uh, Alofa, which is the capital of Tonga, uh, 64 uh, kilometers away. The four closest infrasound stations, which are recording, which are yeah, recording uh, signals under very favorable propagation conditions, and at the top, hydroacoustics. And from that observations, you can date the beginning of the underground and the atmospheric activity, okay, which is which arrive at the same time around four. We identify the most intense phase, okay, which is the paroxysmal uh, phase the climatic phase, between 4.15 and 4.35. And this phase begins with the strongest seismic events at 4.15, and it almost ends with the infrasound event, the most powerful infrasound levels at least, around 4.30. And we don't speculate about the long wave emission times, which is still poorly understood. And so in the final explosion at the very end, uh, four hours later, around 8.31. And this comparison of uh, these different source time functions really suggest a decoupling of the seismic and the infrasound source time functions. So to conclude, I think it's important to mention that these results were obtained less than two months after the event, okay, and from IMS or almost IMS only data. And this demonstrates 
the excellent capability of the MS network to globally and to operationally characterize some extreme events, extreme atmospheric events, at least, uh, like the Ungar uh, eruption. And such events are really opportunity to calibrate uh, this IMS network and to promote the civil and scientific uh, applications. And this is the first event which was detected by the 53 uh, IMS stations. One other im very important point, I think, is really that infrasound sensors, so microbarometers, of the IMS network capture a very broad band of atmospheric waves, so between, once again, 0.1 MHz to 10 Hz. And this allows to characterize strong atmospheric events from microbarometer micro instruments only, after instrument correction. And so we have observed some uh, never observed uh, waves, atmospheric waves, just like lamp waves, okay, which encircled the globe several times, a very powerful event, so between 100 and 200 megatons, so still under discussion, of course. And it's also the, uh, a strong opportunity to investigate some poorly understood volcanological aspects, like phreatomagmatic interaction of large-scale eruptions of caldera-forming events. So if you want to know more about that study, you have the reference to the paper here. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. This time we have somebody to answer questions, but we don't have a time to do so. Oh. Yeah, sorry. Okay. So the next, uh, <laughs> next speaker is Stephanie Donner. She comes from BGR in Germany. So, hello everybody. What I present here is a complementary to the talk we just heard, which, is, which was planned, of course. And um, I want to stress that this is a, a real group effort of almost the entire group at BGR, plus some colleagues of um, Potsdam University. And yeah, probably as everybody, immediately after realizing the strength of this event, we thought about it as a perfect benchmark data set to investigate the available methods in IMS data on the potential of their, yeah, of their potential for the, for the CTPD um, verification regime. So what you see here is the network triggered um, by the event plus additional seismological station which are freely available via the FTSN. So we used all four techniques to analyze this event and we have seen this slide before, thank you. So I can concentrate on the lower right side where is a zoom in into the time span of the early morning of 15th of January. And as you can see here between four and 6 a.m. in the morning, there's happening a lot on all three waveform technologies. And this is the time span we are concentrating on with our analysis. And I want to directly jump into our results so what you can see here are source time functions inverted from seismological waveforms, not only using IMS data, but also the FTSN data. We have inverted these source time functions assuming three different forces on top in blue. Uh, it's based on a single vertical force. In the middle in gray, it's based on a seismic moment tensor we have inverted for beforehand. And the purple one is based on an, a pure explosion source. And we also plotted the source time function from Poli and Shapiro, also published in uh, Virgos et al., just as a comparison. And the shaded areas give you an estimation of the uncertainty of the source time functions. So from Tsimanovsky and Büttner, we know that phreatomagmatic explosions happen into four phases. The first one is a hydrodynamic premixture of magma and seawater, either because the magma is rising or because water is introducing into the cone through cracks. This causes a hydrostatic stable premixture of magma and ocean water, and this phase can last several minutes. And then a sudden pressure disturbance is causing this, that the stability gets crashed 
and we get we start a fragmentation which then directly leads to the abrupt expansion to the explosion of the volcano. So the phase two and three is just a, a matter of, of maybe not even a second until we have the explosion. So we, we think that we can reconstruct uh, in our source time function the all four phases and even a little bit more details. We could um, determine three distinct events based on their transient seismic signal. This is, these are the green vertical lines. Um, and the first one is at 4.1 UDC, where we think that the first cracks open in this main eruption phase and water is introducing into the cone, causing this stable mixture of magma and, and so on. And we see that this phase lasts for about 15 minutes and then something disturbs the, the hydrostatic stability. And we see this big, strong, positive pulse, which is the main explosion at 4.15. So we see also a second pulse at about 4.17, most clearly in the blue uh, source time function based on a single force, but you can also estimate it slightly in the other ones. And then at 4.18, about four minutes after the main eruption, we see the opposite. We have a signal with negative sign, but with more or less the same strength than the main eruption. So what we think happened here, that the explosion happened almost vertically upwards, and four minutes later, something collapsed and just crashes down again. Then, followed by this implosion, we have a phase where we see a couple of implosion and explosion signal going on for quite a lot while. We cannot distinguish them anymore because the signal is overlapping each other. And somewhere around 425, 430, you can maybe estimate that you see kind of signal from the lamp wave also in these source time functions. So this was the result, my conclusion. And now I want to give you some background information how we came to this interpretation. We first started with analyzing the seismic data of the German original seismic network. This is in a distance of more than 16,000 kilometers of the volcano and performed an uh, array analysis here. And what you see is that at 434, we have the first clear signal arriving at the array. It's a PKP phase, which we relate to the main explosion at 415. Then four minutes later, we see another PKP phase train arriving. And already here, you see that it is not only one event. There's more going on, but it's intermixing with each other. What we could separate from each other, we performed the waveform inversion for the seismic moment tensor. So this is for the three transient event at, uh, I call it the pre-event in yellow at 4.1 UTC, the main eruption in green at 4.15, and the main implosion at 4.18 in blue. So on the right side, you see the decomposition of the seismic moment tensor. You can clearly see that the pre-event in yellow and the main eruption is has a strong isotropic component, which is the volume change, which is the, the implosive signal, but you also see that there is a strong CAVD component, and this is a crack opening. You can also see that um, in the Hudson plot, for those of you who are not familiar with this plot, it, it gives you a two-dimensional visualization of the three components of the moment tensor after decomposition. So if you have a pure earthquake shear source, it would end up right in the middle of this plot. And on the vertical axis, you have the isotropic component with explosion on top and implosion extreme on, on bottom. And on the vertical horizontal axis, you have the extremes between positive CIVD and negative CIVD. And you see that uh, the pre-event and the main uh, eruption end up directly somewhere in the middle between implosive and crack opening stuff. While the implosion at 418 very clearly is an implosive signal and right on the upper side of the Hudson plot. And just for curiosity, uh, the, the, the two red dots are the moment tensor solutions for the 2017 DPRK test, which was also followed by an implosion after a few minutes later. So this was again done um, with both IMS data and additionally FDSN data. And uh, it's nicely, it fits to the bathymetric signal. So I said, we think that everything almost got went vertically up and down again, and this is exactly what you see in a bathymetry. The, the volcano um, walls are still standing, which is puzzling, but that's how it is. Um, 
a word to data. What you see here is on the left side, the, again, the Hudson plot for the main explosion, explosive solution, and on the right side, uh, the main implosion at 418. On top is the solution from IMS data only. So this is 29 stations used. And on the bottom, we used FDSN data only. What I showed you before was a mixture of both. What you can see here is that we very nicely get the same result, just that from FTSN data, it is more constrained. The spread within the Hudson plot is less. This can be effect um, of the data. I mean, 29 stations versus 119 stations. It's, of course, better constrained. So I think the key message here is that we are ready. IMS is ready to fulfill the duty of the CDBT. However, FTSN data are helpful, additionally. <laughs> So, so much for seismology. I said we used all techniques. What you see here is now on top um, infrasound data, in the middle again seismic data, in red from IMS only, in green, in gray from FTSN data, and in the bottom hydroacoustic data. What we did here is for each waveform technology, we aligned all data from all stations according to expected theoretical arrival times and just stacked them, just adding them up. It's easy, it's fast, it's simple, you don't need to think about much, you don't need to calculate much, but it has the advantage that you average out path and side effects, and what remains is kind of source time function again, just with the positivity constraint. Um, first conclusion from this plot, when you have a look on the left one, which is a larger time span from three to, I think, seven in the morning, uh, we have a consistent increase of coherently irradiated energy, starting at four, and ending about six. So the main eruptive phase was about two hours, which is consistent to the results of Julian Vergos and his colleagues. And um, right, when you have a look now in the detailed plot, which is a zoom in between 350 and 450, we see that all three source time functions mainly show the same story. That's good. We see some slight differences we see. So for example, at 4.1, we have a clear peak in the hydroacoustic data, which we do not see in the other ones. So we can interpret from them what happens here at that time happens in the ocean. Then later on, we have more energy in the atmosphere and the solid earth. While between the big explosion and implosion, hydroacoustic data show no signal. So the comparison of these data tell us a little bit where things happen. Also interesting in that plot is uh, the infrasound data. We clearly see the peaks of the explosion and implosion, but we also see this signal of this bow arc stretch with its peak peaking at 4.30. That's a lamp wave. So these were some details how we determined the interpretation I showed at the beginning. And now, what we also need to perform when we talk about the CTPD framework, we need the strength, and based on the strength, the yield estimation, also ADM. So this is the last words I want to give. Uh, the classical approach to estimate the strength of an event within the framework of the CTPD is to determine the body wave magnitude from seismic data, and then use magnitude yield relations to estimate the yield. At least this is the classical approach when we analyze DPRK tests and it works quite nicely there. However, this approach has difficulties. First, the magnitude, um, magnitude scales are determined for earthquakes, not for explosions. And there are a lot more. So there are first approaches to also use the other way from techniques to determine the strings. But he can, we need to do more work to find good estimates for the strengths of an event based on all techniques. And, uh, okay. Uh, for the Tonga, we have a specific problem that we do not see P-wave energy. We cannot determine the body wave magnitude. We also have no clear earthquake and no clear explosion. We have something very complex. And we, it is neither onshore nor offshore, so everything fails. Just shortly, for the Hunga Tonga, the lamp wave did the job. This is work done by Matosa et al., also with contributions of BGR colleagues. Concentrate on the blue triangles, which are data from the Kakatau, compared with the black dots, which are for the Hunga event. So this is how we got the estimate that the Hunga event had a yield of 100 to 200 moment tensors. Last slide, 
I said atmospheric transport modeling to detect radionuclides. Of course, we detect nothing. It was no nuclear bomb. It was a volcanic eruption. Uh, but the message is from the backward projection, we can say if it would have been a nuclear bomb with radioactive particles going into the atmosphere, we would have detected by a factor of five. So we, we, uh, we had more release than the lower level we want to detect um, by a factor of five. So I know I was fast. If you want to read again or want to read more details, I lead you to these three publications. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for one question. Please. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, in in no, wait, passage. Wait, wait. No, no, wait for the microphone for the stream. Thank you. Beautiful presentation. Um, yeah, uh, in, in all this complicated source process, uh, can you tell us where more or less the tsunami origination would be placed? Or is there too much uncertainty on that? Uh, we hadn't, we, we never considered the tsunami, so I'm sorry, I, okay. I cannot say it. Thanks. Right, okay, so we need to move on. And the last presentation is uh, also pre-recorded. Uh, Igor Chunchuzov from Obuchov Institute of Atmospheric Physics in Russia. Uh, in my presentation, I would like to present some results of study of the transformation of the form of pressure signal from Tonga volcano with increasing distance from it. The eruption of the underwater volcano Tonga caused wave disturbances simultaneously in the atmosphere, lithosphere and ocean. It is very important to study the characteristics of these waves because uh, they help us to understand and evaluate the response of our environment of such a powerful event as was the Tonga volcano eruption. By now there are many works devoted to the study of the wave disturbances from the Tonga volcano in the atmosphere, in the ocean, lithosphere, including the generation of um, tsunami waves by lamp waves propagating in the atmosphere. The aim of our work is to explain the form of the pressure signal as function of the distance from the volcano and estimate the energy released by volcano eruption to the atmosphere. Here are shown six pressure uh, signals generated by Tonga volcano recorded uh, from January 15 to January 19, 2022 and these signals were recorded by microbarographs installed in the Moscow region and by sensors uh, of the infrasound station IS-43 in Dubna. Some of these signals uh, propagated around the Earth surface twice and were identified as lamp waves. Here we see the transformation of the form of the signals with increasing distance from the volcano. And the distance increases from the top panel to the bottom. And in the signals 
close to the volcano we see that there is a, a high increase in pressure at the front of the signal which follows by the oscillation at the negative phase of the signal when the distance increases the uh, signal at its front becomes flatter and the amplitude of the uh, negative um, uh, phase of the signal becomes uh, greater and uh, its duration increases as well. The uh, uh, lamp wave is a solution of the linearized Cartevec de Vries equation which was obtained in the paper by Pierce and Posey when they studied the propagation of uh, uh, signals from the uh, explosions of nuclear bombs in the um, 60s of the last century. They presented this solution in the form of a convolution of the initial signal near the source designated here as M as a function of dimensionless time mu and uh, uh, airy function. We uh, analyzed this solution uh, and take uh, and took uh, uh, the initial signal in the form shown in this slide. This form is very similar to that of the signals from the nuclear explosions, but the generation mechanism is quite different and also the duration at the front of the signal and duration of the positive phase of the signal is uh, several times greater than uh, those um, from nuclear explosions. Uh, using this, uh, using this uh, um, initial signal, we um, calculated the transformation of the so form of the solution of Kadeva equation with distance, with increasing distance from the source. And uh, this modeling is done as uh, a function of the parameter Q, which is the ratio of the characteristic time of increase of the pressure at the front of the signal, uh, designated his here as T gamma, and so-called dispersion time which is proportional to the distance from the source. We see that this initial signal uh, step by step um, uh, transforms into the oscillating wave packet shown at the bottom of this slide. Uh, here is shown the comparison of the forms of the observed signals at different distances from volcano with the solution of the linearized KDV, KDV equation. The observed signals were recorded on the barographs of station IS-24, IS-30 and La Serena, while the signal at IS-43 was recorded by microbarograph. We can see that uh, the calculated signals pretty well show uh, the uh, transformation of the signal, uh, real signal, when increasing the distance. However, we see that there is a high frequency um, component high frequency modulation of the recorded signal which is not which doesn't present in the model signals. To take into account this uh, high frequency component we calculated the 
contribution of acoustic field, acoustic modes to the resulting signal. So the acoustic modes were calculated by using uh, parabolic equation method developed by Avilov and here we see the comparison of the calculated signal by this uh, method with the um, uh, recorded signal filtered in the range of periods from 46 seconds to 4 minutes. Uh, the calculated signals um, correspond to uh, different effective sound speed profiles um, for different directions of the um, infrasound stations. And this acoustic field was superimposed on the lamp wave so th that the resulting uh, resultant signal uh, calculated as a sum of this lamp wave and uh, acoustic modes is shown at the bottom panels of this slide and uh, this resulting signal is compared with the experimental signals at the station IS24 and IS30. Again we see uh, that calculated signals uh, shows uh, some features of the recorded signals such as uh, uh, long duration of the lamp wave and uh, the modulation of the tail of the signal by high frequency acoustic modes. Also we estimated the energy released by the eruption of volcano to the atmosphere uh, by using uh, formulas obtained from the paper by Pierce and Posey and uh, we obtained uh, the for by uh, actually we used the uh, amplitude and the duration of the positive part of the signal close to the um, volcano and uh, obtained the value of about 300 megatons but uh, Pierce in his paper pointed out that his formula does not take into account the focusing fa factor of the rays at the receiving points and also the uh, scatter of uh, amplitudes of pr pressure signals at different stations so uh, this can lead to an overestimation of the energy by a factor of 3 or 4. Nevertheless, even taking this into account, the estimated energy is greater than the energy released to the atmosphere by a 58 megaton nuclear bomb, which is the most powerful bomb ever tested. This is confirmed by the comparison uh, of the signals from Volcano Tonga at different distances with the um, signals from the 58 megaton bomb at approximately the same distances and from Tunguska meteorite. So we can see that uh, the amplitudes of the signals from volcano and uh, their time its time duration is several times greater than that uh, for the bomb and uh, also it is greater than for the signal from Tunguska meteorite which means that uh, the uh, uh, energy released by volcano was greater than, than for 58 megaton ton bomb. So our conclusions based 
on the solution of the linearized Kortevec de Vries equation, um, we explain the shape of the observed pressure signals depending on the distance from the volcano. Uh, the shape of the pressure signal should be taken into account when modeling tsunami wave generation by the land wave and seismic wave generation. It is shown that the main contribution to the observed signals gives a superposition of lamp mode and acoustics modes, uh, the field of which was calculated by the method of the parabolic equation for the real vertical profiles of the effective sound speed in the atmosphere. Also, we estimated the energy of volcanic eruption in the atmosphere uh, by using pressure amplitude and the characteristic duration of the signal near the source. It gives values exceeding the energy released in the explosion of a nuclear 58 megaton bomb and uh, the original estimate of the energy of the volcanic eruption of 18 megaton given in the first days after the eruption. Uh, thank you for your attention.